Just as you stand, would you like to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6? We'll again go back to the same chapter. And um, I want to start off with one verse there today as we continue um, what we have been studying uh, over the last um, few weeks. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the importance of the Holy Spirit in our personal lives and what he does. And um, we talked about what stops us from experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit, empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our personal lives. Um, today, I just want to go back to that passage, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, and um, um, read from verses 10 onwards. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against the evil rulers and the authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all of this, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning once again, God. We thank you that you have given us another opportunity to receive your word one more time. And would you speak to us? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. We've been uh, talking about, um, for the last couple of weeks, we talked about um, from Ephesians chapter 6. Um, I don't know if you're on. Would you like to on? Um, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. Um, we've been studying the last couple of weeks. We talked about spiritual tra- the importance of spiritual transformation in our believer's life. We talked about how the Holy Spirit really wants to change us from inside. And... Um, what is his goal ultimately? We talked about how at, at the core level, the Holy Spirit wants to have, um, give us a spiritual transformation to a place where um, we are able to uh, distinguish between right and wrong. We are able to distinguish between what comes from God, what comes from evil. We are able to walk uh, with God, knowing the heart of God in a way that um, uh, we don't have to worry about what is the will of God anymore. We actually sense the will of God Um, in every moment of our lives. And there would never be a place where we are questioning um, the will of God in our lives. So that's where he wants us to go to. We then started talking about what stops us from actually um, experiencing that spiritual transformation. Why most Christians are not, um, are being transformed spiritually. We are changed, we have a moral transformation inside us, but we are not fully transformed. And... um, um, from Ephesians chapter 6, we began to see uh, the, uh, the devil has strategies that he would use in order to um, you know, um, stop us from being fully transformed by keeping us um, you know, um, deceived with his lies. We talked about how either we are on spirit, spirit's control or as human beings, we are under Satan's control. We are never uh, in charge of our own lives. We are actually either listening to the thoughts that come from uh, the, the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, devil who is influencing us to think that way and make decisions that way while the choice is ours, decisions are ours, uh, but we are influenced by what devil does. So therefore, we naturally put ourselves under the control of sa- Satan or we are in the control of the Holy Spirit who uses the word of God to control our lives. Uh, that's why uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says, uh, in the whole armor of God, one of the things that he talks about, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's, um, uh, that's something you need to remember. Holy Spirit uses 
the word of God to help us um, uh, to live a life that is fully transformed. And I talked about how, um, you know, the prince of this world controls our lives and five levels of uh, demonic control um, in this world. And some of us may fall in that category. La last week, I talked about how um, Satan builds 10 types of strongholds in our lives. And of course, I'm not going to, uh, I, as I told you last week, I just talked about only three of them. And the, the first three of them, uh, personal strongholds, um, mental strongholds, and family strongholds, how he uses them um, you know, to keep us uh, under bondage. Um, and um, we're giving you an opportunity to join us. On the 26th of uh, November, um, we're, we're doing a conference called, a seminar called Break Free Seminar, and I, I want you to um, uh, take time, that one day, take time to join us. Um, um, in that, I'm going to you know, go back into some of these and um, kind of go through everything and explain um, how um, these strongholds actually work in our lives and what should we do in order to break them and how the Holy Spirit empowers us um, with the gifts and what he does in our lives and how do we actually use those gifts in our lives and live free. Um, so three areas of uh, our spiritual life we're going to talk on um, during the, um, that one-day seminar. We're going to talk about spiritual transformation. We're going to talk about spiritual gifting. And we're going to talk about spiritual disciplines that will help us to live free. Um, you know, not only be set free, but actually live free after we received freedom. Um, if you're serious about your Christian walk, if you really want to experience a transformed life, and if you feel that this is something I do need to have an understanding of, you need to be part of that um, uh, a seminar on that day. Set that one day aside. Your life may never be the same again. Um, it's just one day. Uh, you know, we, we spend a lot of time at different places, but this this would be a great day for you. So at the end of the service, actually last week we just left it open for anybody to just connect with us. We we are going to put a, a counter outside. Just give her your name, and um, in fact they have a QR code that you can enroll immediately. It's just three questions. Uh, the only reason we want to know that is we do want to prepare food for you. So want to make sure that uh, uh, we know how many people are coming. We want to make sure there's enough material for you to, um, you know, um, we prepare the enough material for all of you to have. I want to um, just give a, um, in, inside, just in case you're going to miss that day. Uh, I, this is not an excuse for you to miss that day, but just in case you, you, you just cannot, you just can't. I want to uh, give you... Um, a couple, of, a couple of practical steps on how do you tear down the strongholds in your life. Can you do that? Can I do that? Okay, I'm just going to um, you know, go through them um, like, like in two minutes because I have something else to share with you today. Um, I'm, I'm hoping I'll do it in two minutes unless the Holy Spirit wants to take over right now, um, which I do want him to do that. Um, um, there are four things that you need to do in order to tear down the walls the strongholds that are in your life. That means if Satan has built something in your life that is stopping you from experiencing a full freedom, complete freedom, there are four things that we do need to remember. Uh, number one, uh, be in right relationship with God. Now, these are simple things, but these are important things for you to remember. Be in right relationship with God, which simply means this that if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, accept Jesus as your personal savior. You could have been born as a Christian. You must be born again to be a Christian. You probably are born into a Christian home or you're simply following Christ simply because your parents have accepted Christ or you, uh, the rest of your family accept, con, you know, accepted Jesus Christ and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You simply are now identifying yourself with them, but don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, today would be a good day to ask Jesus to come into your heart um, because unless you're born again, you'll not be able to break free, experience freedom in your life. So be in re right relationship with, um, with God. But not only born again, you must be in right relationship with the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment today. But you must be in right relationship. With, that means you need to walk with him every single day. Uh, growing constantly uh, by through the scriptures and walk in your relationship with him. Uh, so 
be filled by the Holy Spirit. I'll come to that today. In fact, that's the whole thought that I'm going to talk on today. Um, the second thing that you, um, a second step that we can take in order to break uh, the strongholds is um, confess all known and unknown sins in your life. Unknown sin simply means unconfessed sins. That's what I mean. If you have ever, uh, you remember last week I told you about how there are some things that you would have done and ignored to confess them to God um, because you felt like that's a too small thing. Uh, I mean, I've never really actually committed adultery. I only at thought level, it's okay. Uh, or, you know, something like that. If you, if you still hold on to that, that's going to come back to you and bite you again. So you might want to confess that in the presence of God and deal with adultery, deal with any kind of hatred, bitterness that you work, you know, you harbored for a long time. If you don't deal with that, they're going to hold on to you and um, come back to you. But Bible says, if you confess all your sins, then God is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Simply means this, that if you truly, honestly confess your sin, then God not only forgives you, but cleans you completely and gives you a fresh start, a new start. So confess um, all known and unknown sins, uh, not only yours, but also your families, also people who belong to you. All the um, uh, great leaders in the scripture you would see, all the faithful um, you know, followers of God always confess not only their sins, but they also confess their family sins. They confess their nation's sins and ask God to forgive them um, personally and also as a nation and as a family and as a nation. So you, on, your, on behalf of your family, you can actually confess their sins and ask God, um, not that they will be forgiven, but at least you began the pray, pro process and the Holy Spirit would start talking to them unless they come to Jesus Christ. Obviously, their sins will not be forgiven. But um, you start the prayer and the Holy Spirit would start working in their lives. And who knows, um, the, the father, the mother that you've been praying for would actually come to Jesus Christ because you started praying for them. Does it make sense? Okay. Uh, and then the third uh, step um, is, um, here is, here is something that um, I, I think we need to remember. Seek deliverance from root sins. Now, I don't have time to talk on this, but there are five root sins that Bible talks about. Five things that are deeply rooted at a subconscious level that actually control us. Um, um, fear. Um, we'll talk more on this uh, at the spiritual um, break, free, break free seminar. Um, number two, um, bitterness. Number three, um, Pride. Um, number four, lust. Oh, actually, I started with the ABC, right? Okay. And then um, greed. These are five primary root sins that control our lives. If you actually watch them, you'll realize all of us are struggling with one of them. At some point, we are controlled by some of, one of these. Um, I, I can give a lot of scriptures, but I, I, right now I can't do that um, for the sake of time. But the, these are five root sins that you do need to seek deliverance from God. Satan will have control over your life using this in, innermost desires of your heart to control your life. And uh, number four, uh, put yourself, be under spiritual authority. Be under proper spiritual authority. Be under proper, proper spiritual authority. If you have godly parents who pray for you, who pray, who have a relationship with God, they are your supreme spiritual authority here on earth. Not your pastor, your parents. If they are godly people, your parents are the first authority God placed on your life. Remember that. That's why Paul starts off by saying, children, obey your parents. Remember that. Children, 
if, if you have parents who are praying every day, put yourself under their authority. Sometimes what they ask you to do, you may not like it. Um, some suggestions that they give, you may not like it. But they pray for you. They have a spiritual covering over your life. They're praying for you every day. And so that means they have um, you know, more love for you than anybody else in this world. Uh, you, you might want to be under their authority. Now, I understand when you don't have a spiritual parent in your life, then look for the spiritual authority. The next spiritual authority that God places in your life, whether it is your pastor, whether it is somebody uh, who led you to Jesus Christ, who is ahead of you in their spiritual walk, put yourself under their authority. Does it make sense? Okay, who is the first authority in our lives? Parents. If you have godly parents, they are your final authority. Not your pastor, not some prophets uh, from America uh, or some part of India, but your parents. If they are praying parents, they are your authority. Then comes the rest of the people. Fine? Okay. <laughs> Just remember that. That's a very important thing for, uh, um, for us to remember. Um, okay, Th these are four things that you can do. We'll talk when, if you're there on the... Um, I'll talk more on uh, how do you actually practically break them down in a, in a much more um, in a deep, um, um, comprehensive way um, when I um, do it on 26th. But today, I want to focus on one verse that Paul talks about. When he's talking about uh, be careful of um, a strategies of Satan, and he talked about how Satan is working in this world, he, uh, the first instruction he gave was, put on your spiritual armor. You remember that? He asked us to put on an armor that will help us to stand firm and defend ourselves against the strategies of Satan. Um, put on uh, your, your spiritual armor. We'll talk about spiritual armor the first month of 2023, um, and then we start off from there. Actually, how do we, because I think it will be a great, great start for 2023 to start talking about um, spiritual armor so that you can have a wonderful year ahead in 2023. Um, because uh, obviously I need to explain every single one of them, so I'm not going to, um, it will not be, it will be foolish of me to start off right now. Um, but put on the spiritual armor. And then he said something that, that kind of caught my attention, and, and I, the whole series is based on that one idea that Paul threw at us. Look at what he says in verses 18. He says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert, be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. One thing he specifically um, highlighted there is, of course, pray at all times. That's what he's saying, right? Pray at all times. If you really want to fight against the works of the devil in your life, pray at all times. Then he goes on to add something to it. He goes on to say, pray in the spirit at all times. Pray, what does it mean by pray in the spirit at all times? Now I understand pray at all times. That, that, that may be hard for me because obviously I have work to do. I have to get up in the morning, brush my teeth, eat my breakfast, go to my office. I've got a lot of things to do. So um, I, I may find it a little difficult to pray all the times, everywhere, uh, but I understand the concept of praying everywhere at all times. But what does it actually mean by pray in the spirit at all times? Why did he focus on that one area? Because he knew for us to pray at all times is practically difficult. And so therefore, he's asking us to invite somebody who lives in us and consistently, constantly prays for us on behalf of us, through us. In fact, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, Paul describes the work of the Holy Spirit. And he says, when you don't know how to pray, when you don't have words to pray, when you don't know what to say to God, Holy Spirit, on your behalf, would begin to pray. He would talk to Father on your behalf, through you. I think that's what Paul actually meant. When he said pray in the spirit all times, he's, he's saying let the Holy Spirit work in your life. He would do that for you. So there is something very important about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I began to wonder, uh, um, you know, uh, 
why is it so important? Then I kind of went back all through the scriptures and began to look at um, some, you know, uh, um, uh, through the scriptures on how God unfolded this whole um, uh, mystery of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then I realized that right from the Old Testament, from the things that God said and God did, uh, and then how God um, um, uh, fulfilled them in the New Testament, and then the commission that God gave, everything is interconnected. And I want to show that to you um, today. Is that okay? Um, I understand all of you are educated people. So I, I, don't, I just don't want to say something. I want to show you through the scriptures what I'm saying is right. And I want, I want to give the option for you to start thinking about this seriously and uh, allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Now, um, today I want to talk about the importance of three in a believer's life. There is something about three in the Bible, and I want to talk on that, okay? The significance, I don't know how to title this, maybe this would be my message. The significance of three in a believer's life. I want to take you straight to the Old Testament first and then set that as a context and then begin to show you how this all is related to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In Exodus chapter 23, let's go there. In Exodus chapter 23, verses 14 to 19. Actually, even before that, let's go to Acts chapter 19. I'll come to that. I'll, I'll go to Exodus chapter 23, but let's look at Acts chapter 19, verses 1. Um, why this whole series came out is, 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 this is why this whole series came out. And I want to show you that. Um, Acts chapter 19, verses 1. While Apollos was in uh, Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Now, look at the question that he's asking them. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. It's a very interesting and a peculiar question to ask believers, okay? Now, we already started talking about, we already know that I cannot come to Jesus Christ, um, I cannot confess my sins unless the Holy Spirit is working in my life, right? So if these guys are designated as, recognized as believers, identified as believers, why is then Paul asking the same question to them? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Were you baptized in the Holy Spirit? That's what he's asking. No, they replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Believers are saying. Now, these are believers. You remember that. They are identified as believers, meaning they have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They believe in Jesus. They are following Jesus. They are following Jesus. Actually following Jesus. But have no clue about who Holy Spirit is and what he does. So Paul begins to uh, begin to then ask them the next question. Then what baptism did you experience? So for Paul, in his mind, the day you accept Jesus Christ, the natural thing should happen in a believer's life is to be filled by the Holy Spirit. Have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's why he's asking, which kind of baptism did you have? You see that? This is Paul, huh? the one who we always go and study, by the way. And then they began to say, well, we took baptism in uh, uh, the, the, the baptism of John, which means the water baptism. We took water baptism. Some of you have taken water baptism. And so he's saying, well, that's not enough. Look at what he's saying. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance of sin. So it simply means this. He's saying, the reason you take baptism in the water is that you're telling people that I have confessed my sins and I received Jesus into my life. As a symbol of my confession and my repentance, I'm taking baptism in the water by immersion. But John himself told people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. And as soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Paul laid their hands on them and the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. So, 
this is where my the whole thought process began uh, for me to be, um, begin prepared uh, for this entire series. It, it is not enough for me just to simply accept Jesus Christ. It's not enough for me to simply be baptized in the water, but it's also important for me if I have as a, as a Christian, if I have to live my life effectively, then I do need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so that's, that's when I went back. What was Paul teaching to them? What did Paul teach to them? He must have used something else in the scripture in order to, uh, to teach to these people. And that must have been Old Testament, not the New Testament, obviously. He must have had the Old Testament in his hand. And he was using the Old Testament scriptures to talk to them and show them, this is what God told. Better look at the scriptures and then understand uh, what does it actually mean. Uh, and so uh, my search began. And that's when I began to see um, the importance of three in the scriptures. In Exodus chapter 23 now, God is talking to these people who uh, are now given um, you know, uh, the commandments. They, they are given a rules on how to live in this world, what to do, and all that stuff. Then he goes on to tell them to do something very important. Look at what he does in Exodus chapter 23, verses 14 onwards. Now, I know... This is teaching, and teaching can be boring sometimes. Um, if, you f if you feel like bored, like uh, Aitak, you know what will happen to that guy, right? I'll have to come down and wake you up from sleep. So um, if you feel like sleeping, get up and walk back and stand there and listen. But listen, this is very important. Listen, that's the point there. Don't sleep. If you sleep, you'll miss something that is really important for your life. Even if you feel bored, straighten yourself and listen to this. Um, and I, I can't urge you more than that. <laughs> I've never done this in the church. I never asked you to do that. But I'm asking you now, understand how important this is for you. Verses 14. Each year, you must celebrate three festivals in my honor. This is God commanding his people. And he's saying, listen, every year, there are three festivals that I want you to celebrate. Okay. First, celebrate the festival of unleavened bread, which simply means celebrate the festival of Passover. Remember that. Passover. For seven days, the bread you eat must be made without yeast, just as I commanded you. Celebrate this festival annually at an appointed time in the early spring, in the month of Abib. For that is the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. No one may appear before me without an offering. Let's pause there. The first festival that God asked them to celebrate is Passover. What happened on Passover during the delivery of um, uh, Hebrews from the Egypt, you remember? That all their children were saved, protected, while death passed through the nation of Egypt. Everyone who did not have the lamb's blood put on their um, um, in a door were killed. Every single one of them. Passover was a symbol of how death that comes from our sin will destroy our lives. And how the slain lamb's blood would save us from certain death. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a foreshadow of the cross. Paul talks about that in the book of uh, Corinthians. He talks about how actually the Passover festival, God put that festival there because for people to understand, there is no other way to be saved except for the slain lamb's blood. There's no other way for you to be saved. And so in order to foreshadow what is going to happen at the cross, the lamb of God, who is Jesus Christ, Again, you will see, the, see him addressed as the Lamb of God in the Revelation, the book of Revelation. The Lamb of God has to die on the cross, shed his blood. Through his blood, your death would be taken away from you. That's why you and I are living every day and breathing right now. In spite of the sin, in spite of our uh, continuous uh, our disobedience to God, because we came to Jesus Christ, God is continuing to show grace on our lives because the lamb died. So Passover festival is actually a foreshadow of our salvation. 
1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. So, while Old Testament talks about Passover, New Testament, Paul explains what does it actually mean, Passover. Uh, maybe you want me to write down, I'll write down the scriptures. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. The second one, he then goes on to say, second, celebrate the festival of harvest. When you bring me the first crops of your harvest. Now this is, of course, he explains that more in uh, Leviticus chapter 16. Right now, I'm not going there. I'm just trying to give you a hint. This is called the festival of Pentecost. Again, this is a seven-day seven celebration. Passover is a seven-day celebration. Pentecost is a seven-day celebration. He, he, basically, Pentecost is the day where all the believers, all the people of Israel will come together, gathering all their harvest for the harvest that God had given to them, and then begin to give thanks to God for all that God had given to them. And then they offer their first crops to God. That's why it's called Festival of Harvest or Festival of Pentecost. On that day, they celebrate the goodness of God in their lives. How God provided for them to survive in this world. They were once without a land. They were once without, um, uh, you know, uh, anything to live for, live on. They were in the desert, right? They didn't have anything to live on. There was nothing for them to live on. Now God brought them into a land, helped them to settle, in, settle down in the promised land and gave them an inheritance. Saying that every single one of you, Jew, will have a land on which you can live, have a home, have a land to produce fruit and live. Every day you live there, you need to remember that I am the one who is providing you, sustaining you, helping you to live your life. And once in a year, come together, remember that. All the providence that God has given to you to sustain here on earth. Now, when we come to New Testament, as we begin to believe in Jesus, we are now moving from our old life into a new life. And we have an unexplored land we are in. We don't know where, how to live in this world. We don't know how to sustain ourselves as Christians. We have neither, neither the power nor uh, the resources to actually be a Christian in a world that is completely opposite to us. We don't know how to sustain, survive in this world. That's why Jesus said in, uh, in John chapter 14, I know that when I'm not there, you're going to be afraid. I know the world will rise up against you. I know you're going to be scared. I know that you don't know how to live in this world. That is why I'm sending you a helper. I'm going to send you somebody who's going to provide everything that you need, who's going to help you to be sustained here in this world, help you through, go through the journey as a Christian and then enter into the promised land. So Pentecost is actually a symbol of the power of God in a believer's life. Now, in Acts chapter 1, verses 8, what did Jesus ask them to do? Go into all the world, preach the gospel, right? Starting with Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world. Before you go, wait till you receive power from above. In other words, what Jesus is saying is this. You cannot be an effective Christian in this world without the power of the Holy Spirit. That is who is going to help you to bear fruit through your life. And it's, it, it's, it's probably, um, it's not a coincidence that God took, used the Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, the day of festival of Pentecost to actually let the Holy Spirit come into this world, almost signifying the transformation from physical to a spiritual providence. Showing us that so far you've been physically provided, now I'll provide you with spiritual power that you need to live as a Christian. So um, you see that, the power of God. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Then of course, the third one, 
is uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. Let's go back there. Finally, celebrate the festival of final harvest at the end of harvest season. When you have harvested all the crops from your field, at these three times each year, every man in Israel must appear before the sovereign Lord. It's called Feast of Tabernacles. Now, in, again, in Leviticus chapter, um, uh, in the book of Leviticus, um, explain, you know, uh, Moses further explains what does it actually mean, Feast of Tabernacles. But let me just give you a glimpse into that because I need to move on to the next one. In Feast of Tabernacles, after the harvest festival, seven weeks from that, they will gather together. The harvest is finished. The second harvest is also finished. They all come together. Outside of their homes, they gather at one place, under the tents. That's why it's called tabernacles. Okay? They gather under the tents. Once in a year, they gather. Under, they leave everything that God gave them. Their home, their land. They get out of that place, gather outside together as a nation at one place, put up the tents, live under that for seven days, only praising God. What is this signifying? It is signifying that all I need is the presence of God. I don't need my land. I know I got harvest. I got everything. But that's not more important. That's not important at all in the, in the, um, in the you know, in comparison to the presence of God in our lives. That's why God taught them, leave everything. Now gather together. You got your harvest. You got all your money. You got all your, you know, you made everything. Now leave everything. Come out and sit together. Simply to say, thank you, God, for this. We all, all we need is your presence, nothing else, nothing more important. This will happen when Jesus comes back. That's the day we leave everything here. In this world, all the believers would gather together. It's a symbol of the second coming of Jesus Christ. When we all get caught up with him, sit with our um, a king, without worries, without any of these attachments, only in his presence, always. The first two are fulfilled already. The third one will be fulfilled. And Jesus will come back soon, very soon. And that's the day we are all going to come together as believers and be with him um, in his presence, celebrating this, uh, the presence of God. Nothing is more important than him. And so the Feast of Tabernacle is actually a symbol, um, symbolic expression of um, the second coming of Christ. Paul talks about it in 1 Thessalonians. The day that Jesus comes to sit with us and we're all going to spend with him forever, our time. So, the first two are fulfilled already. That means just as much as salvation is important for us, the power of God, which comes by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, is also important for us. That's what I was trying to prove all this way. As much as we need to be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ, we must also then take the anointing of the Holy Spirit very seriously the baptism of the Holy Spirit very seriously. So this, this is, that's why I took you to the Old Testament. Now let's jump to the New Testament and start looking at um, three things that, three baptisms that Paul talks about in the New Testament. I talked about three festivals. Now I'm going to talk about three baptisms. Three festivals show the importance of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, in much more simpler uh, you know, language, Paul explains why is it important for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 13, Paul says, we are all baptized into one, one spirit, into one body. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, you're all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you, are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. 
He's not just talking about baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now there, in those two verses, he's talking the first one, being baptized um, into the body of Christ. The day we get saved, we get baptized into the body of Christ. That's why we go to church. That's why we come together as a body of Christ. We're all now part of the body of Christ. Um, the, he keeps going back to that, that particular um, um, you know, uh, analogy of how all of us are different parts in the body of Christ. Right? You remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he talks about how we, are all, we all have different functions. All of us, like, like different parts of the body, working together, serving together, um, you know, the body of Christ. In Romans chapter 8, he talks about how we're all different parts of the body and how we must then work together. In Romans chapter 12, he goes on to say how each one of us have different calling and how each one must serve the body of Christ. We are part of the body of Christ. We are baptized. You know, he used that word, baptized into the body of Christ. The second one, he does talk about water baptism. Baptized in the water. Everyone who accepted Jesus Christ must be baptized. Paul talk, uh, Peter talked about it in, in Acts chapter 2. If you uh, confess your sins, be baptized in the water. Whoever acknowledges me, Jesus said, before men, I will also, in Matthew chapter 10, whoever acknowledges me um, before men, I will also acknowledge him before the Father in heaven. How does, what does it mean I acknowledge Jesus before men? Does it mean I'm going to take a mic and go around and say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian? Is that what it actually means? That's not what it means. What Jesus is saying is your life, your action, must reflect that you actually acknowledge me. That you are never shying away from standing up as a believer. Never shying away from being identified as a follower of Jesus Christ. The first act of me saying I belong to Jesus is by taking baptism in the water. Saying to the whole world, I am now a believer in Jesus Christ and I'm following in Jesus Christ. If any one of you is hesitating to take baptism in the water, you are basically saying, I don't, I, I'm not really sure whether I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. That's what you're trying to say. You are being, be, being afraid of acknowledging Jesus through your life. Look at what he goes on to say. If uh, in the verses 33 of uh, Matthew chapter 10, but whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my father in heaven. Do you know the only hope for you to go to heaven is Jesus? And if Jesus says, I don't know this fellow, you're gone. He, would, he says, the only way I'll say that is when you say, I don't know who Jesus is. When you, with your action, with your, with your choices, with your lifestyle, with uh, not following the commands of Jesus, when you are saying, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure I want to do this, you're actually disowning Jesus, and Jesus says, I will disown you in front of the Father. Um, so, um, don't hesitate to take baptism in the water in case you have not yet taken uh, number three, of course, he talks about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 8, verses 14 to 17, you'd see an interesting thing happening. The church in Samaria is formed. The Gentiles uh, have now come to Jesus Christ. Philip has gone there to preach the gospel, many accepted Jesus Christ. Now when the apostles, Bible says, look at what he says, in Acts chapter 8, verses 14. Now the reason I'm highlighting that is because uh, for you to understand why I'm stressing on this again and again. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they then sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, Peter and John arrived, they prayed for them, for whom? For Samaritans who, who came to Jesus. Prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. 
because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any one of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord, Jesus, which means they took water baptism, right? So they've accepted Jesus Christ. They took water baptism. You remember in Acts chapter 19, you saw people who took baptism in the name of John. So Paul says, no, 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 you should take baptism in the, in, in the name of Jesus. And then he goes on to talk to them about the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now here, Samaritans already accepted Jesus Christ and also baptized in the water. But then the church in Jerusalem sent their leaders to pray over them so that they might have the third baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And they received the Holy Spirit. So there you go. Three baptisms. There are three witnesses for us. For our um, transformation in life. As a Christian. John, 1 John chapter 5. Go back and read. Uh, open it and read it. Uh, as I'm reading it. 1 John. Chapter 5, verses 7 to 8. For there are three people that bear witness in heaven for us. One, the Father, the Word, which is Jesus Christ, by the way, and the Holy Spirit. Three witnesses for us in heaven. And all these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. The spirit, the water, and the blood. What, what, is the, what are those three? Now, some of us never read these verses, no? We're like, where are these? First time. Three. And the, all these three agree as one. So here on earth, as a Christian, the three things that will bear witness for you are the blood of Jesus Christ, which you accepted on the day of your salvation, the water into which you took water baptism that will stand up as a, as a witness for you here on earth. The third one, the spirit that will bear witness for you as a Christian here on earth. Meaning, somebody is authenticating you as a Christian here on earth. Somebody is authenticating you in heaven as a Christian, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here on earth, somebody is authenticating you as a Christian. The day you took baptism, uh, you know, the day you accept Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, and the water in which you took baptism, and then the Holy Spirit, by whom you are filled. You see what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to convince you to understand the importance of being filled with the Holy Spirit. So that means if all those three are not marked in my life, if I didn't receive all those three, then I'm not a Christian. I'm not the one that God wants me to be. Could it be that reason why we're all struggling in our Christian faith? That we are not allowing the Holy Spirit to take control of our lives completely, transform us to be the kind of power-filled faithful uh, Christians here on earth. That we are hesitating because of things that we have heard or maybe things that we have seen because of certain false things that we have witnessed. Remember, the presence of falsehood means there is truth. Isn't it? We call something counterfeit because there is something original. Just because there are counterfeit preachers, just because there are counterfeit miracles, just because there is a some kind of counterfeit manifestation of the Holy Spirit, doesn't mean there is no Holy Spirit. Doesn't mean there is no baptism of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the very presence of a counterfeit should encourage us to believe there must be some truth. That's why I'm trying to open up the scriptures and trying to say, don't be ashamed of receiving the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Don't be ashamed to ask him. I want to give you three suggestions and I'll close. Um, 
I've got 16 pages of notes, and I did only two pages right now. So <laughs> I'm not going to go there. I, I'm just going to um, talk about something very important for us, um, for us to remember. I talked about three festivals that will point out, that are pointing out to the present church age and the coming age. And then I talked about three kinds of baptisms that Bible talks about that we must all have. I talked about three witnesses for us uh, as a Christian, uh, that authenticate us as a Christian, right? From John chapter 5, verses um, 7 and 8. Maybe I just write down. Three witnesses. What are the three witnesses? The blood. The blood, the water, and the spirit. This is our witness in this world, our mark in this world. These are the ones who will authenticate us as a Christian. And then um, I want to talk about, um, you know, again, I want to highlight three. Um, I've got five minutes, so I can do this. Um, every time I think of five minutes I got, I don't know if I actually finish in five minutes. <laughs> so I'm scared of that. Uh, and I don't want you to lose uh, your concentration. So three gifts that come from God. Three promises that came from God. Three gifts of God. For a believer. A lot of threes, you know? <laughs> Number one. Eternal life. Romans chapter 6, verses 23. For the wages of sin is death. You see, from the beginning, I'm connecting everything. Passover was about death and salvation. Now, Paul is just simply explaining that to us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay? Number two, the Holy Spirit is a gift of God for us. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. Wait, so far we've been only talking about the power that comes from above. But actually Jesus is saying he's a gift to you. Holy Spirit is a gift to you. You know what gift means? You don't work for it. Somebody saying, I want to give you comes some kind of gift to you. And he's giving to you. He's saying, hey, actually I'm giving it for free. Wouldn't it be rude for us to say, I don't want that. Wouldn't it be rude? Don't you think it would be disrespectful when you, when somebody, elder comes to you and gives you a gift? It doesn't matter what that gift is. They're giving you a gift. Don't you think as human beings, we care so much about respect and disrespect, obedience and disobedience. God himself is saying, I want to give you a gift. God, who created you, who made a way for you to be saved by giving his own son to die on the cross. God who gave up so much for you is now saying, now that you have, you have accepted Jesus as your personal savior, now that you responded to what I did for you, I want to give you a gift. And you're saying, no, I'm not really sure I should have that. Really? The gift of the Father is the Holy Spirit. Then, the gift of the Holy Spirit is the spiritual gifts. That's the third uh, gift um, God is giving to us, the um, spiritual gifts, which Paul explains to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The whole, entire chapter 12, 13, and 14 are explanation of the gifts, and we'll talk about that um, in, on the um, on, on Break Free Seminar. Um, now, about the spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. A spiritual, in verse 7, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. What he's saying is, Spirit of God is giving you a gift. That's what he's saying. 
each of you have a gift. You would say, I really don't know. I'm not sure whether you actually have. What you, you probably are ignorant of that gift. Nobody told you that you got a gift. But you have a gift. None of you, if you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior and invited Jesus to come into your life, none of you cannot, cannot say, none of you can say, I don't have a gift. You have a gift. Eternal life, Holy Spirit, and a spiritual gift. You could be ignorant of that. You don't know that part. I understand that. But you just cannot say, I don't have it. You have it. All of us. And that gift is a, is, a, is a love gift from the Holy Spirit to all of us. Now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit activates that gift inside us. You understand that? The baptism of the Holy Spirit will do something in your life. It empowers you begin to begin to use that gift inside you. And then you would use it without hesitancy. He would enlighten your mind to see that gift. And then begins to, uh, you begin to use that. And then you would begin to see, oh, I never thought this. So it's a gift from God. I, I have a gift of teaching. Well, I mean, if I say that now, it'll look really hard. But when I was in the Bible school, I hated standing in front of people and speak. I still hate that. But I mean, I hate it less now. But you know, I, the thing is, is, still I get onto the stage, I'm scared to come on stage. Trust me, even today. <coughs> Till I come onto the stage, I'm like, God, am I going to make sense to people? Will they understand what I'm about to say? And then the Holy Spirit will remind me, not you, bro. Not you. You get on stage, you open your mouth, let me speak. And let me talk to people. Let me explain to people. And so it's a gift. A gift from the Holy Spirit. Now as you stand, begin to do that, you would start mastering it. You would start becoming more confident in what God has asked you to do. Uh, you know, God has given to you and then you begin to use it more. The, the, the more you use it, the more God begins to use it. Now, here is the thing, I don't want, I, actually I didn't want to di digress from what I'm about, what I'm teaching to you, but let me close with that. First Corinthians chapter 12, right? Verses 1 to 7. Um, my spiritual gift has nothing to do with my spiritual maturity. I'll explain that in, 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 in the seminar. So um, don't, don't misquote me right now. Don't put it on Twitter, what I'm, about, what I'm saying right now. I, I just understand. I'm, I'm hoping that you're all mature enough to understand what I'm saying. My spiritual gifting has nothing to do with my spiritual maturity, which simply means this, that I don't have to be spiritually mature to begin to be used by God. Does it make sense now? Okay, now you can quote me. Both the statements have to be quoted together. Okay? My spiritual maturity has nothing to do with my spiritual gifts. I can continue to use the spiritual gifts as I am growing. Most of us are hesitate to use the spiritual gifts because we think I'm not there yet. You understand? But the moment you start using it, the Holy Spirit will start enabling you to start using it. Now you understand why even though some of us disobeyed God, I disobeyed God, God still used me on stage? It's the grace of God that he would use broken people like me, uh, sinful people like me, to continue to bring his holy word to people. It's a gift. He cannot take it back. But then in the process, he's also changing me. Now, um, with this, I, cl I close. <laughs> I keep saying I close. A spiritual gifts um, is, is a supernatural enablement of the Holy Spirit to use natural people for his glory. So it'll tell me every time, it'll tell me that's not me, it's the Holy Spirit who's doing this. It'll help people to understand it's not that person, but it is the Holy Spirit who's doing this through his life or her life. So 
I'm just Holy Spirit is in you and is for you. He's, he's, he's upon you so that you can be used for others. He's in you so that he can change your character. He's upon you so that you can serve his ministry. That's the difference. The Holy Spirit is inside me so that he can begin to work in me, change my character, but he's upon me, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, so that I can serve others and serve the mission of God. You see the difference now? That is why we all need to receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Take away any kind of prejudice. Like next week, I'll talk about how do we receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But let me close here with this. Don't just, just come to him by faith. Ask him by faith. Now you know that your spiritual maturity has nothing to do with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That the anointing of the Holy Spirit would fall upon you and he would begin to use you and while he's working in you, changing you, transforming you to make you better, don't hesitate to ask him to come into your life. Don't hesitate to ask him to fill you and he will. Just by simply by faith. Put all the misconceptions, preconceptions aside, prejudices aside. You may have witnessed something. You may have had a false uh, understanding before. Put them aside now. Go to the scriptures. Ask the Holy Spirit. And he will come. Let's pray. Maybe we all need to pray. All those walls that we built by ourselves with prejudices, he would break them down. Um... And that he would break out in our lives. And he would set us free completely. Would you do that? Just take this moment. Ask Holy Spirit to break out among us. Bring those walls down that we have built through false, false teachings, prejudices. And ask him to break them down. Come on, Holy Spirit. Break out among us. Break those walls down, God. You may be even struggling with unbelief. Is it all true? Can I, can I really have... Just for today, ask him if, if Holy Spirit can help you. Even, in fact, he helps you to put, the, put your unbelief also aside. So ask him, would you please help me? Overcome my unbelief to God, my fear, anything that is stopping you. Okay, as the worship team begins to sing, whatever your wall is, the thing that is stopping you from actually experiencing the work of the Holy Spirit, would you please allow him? Thank you, Jesus.
Jesus. As we sit in your presence, God, Holy Spirit, would you begin to work in our lives, God? Take away all prejudices. Take away all misunderstanding. Take away any kind of false teaching that is holding us down. Break it, God. May the scripture come alive, clear to us. And some of us may, may find it a little difficult to accept. And yet, God, would you please open our eyes to see the truth as it is. One thing has become very clear to us now, that we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit, not just because we want to be empowered, but because it is a requirement from you that you want us to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Just as you want us to be baptized into the body of Christ. Just as you commanded us to be baptized in the, uh, bapt uh, in the water. You wish for us to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We know that it is Holy Spirit who is already in us who's led us to Jesus, convicted us of our sin. And now we know that we need him to begin to work through us as we love him and, and God in a very special way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Would you please take away unbelief? Would you please take away prejudices? Would you please take away any misunderstandings, any false teaching that is holding us? Break them down, God, those walls, so that we can experience true freedom. Thank you, Jesus. I pray for everyone who is here right now. May the word they received begin to work in their lives, and may they begin to think about this. Prepare themselves. Prepare themselves in the light of the scriptures to receive you. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name. Bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us today. And I'm, I was actually hoping uh, Pastor Ashwin would come. Um, so let me just go ahead and do the announcements. Uh, we, um, we have, um, obviously, we, we talked about the Break Free uh, Conference. So uh, I'd like for you, at the end of the service, outside at the lobby, we have a counter. Just... Use the QR code to enroll yourself. Don't worry about the payment. Just do it. Just do the enrollment first. OK, no, number two, and I think we, we do want to make sure uh, any student is, is welcome, welcome free um, So for, for a break-free conference. If you're a student, if you're, if you're studying, it's free for you. It's open for you. Just, just join us. And um, um, anyone who's working, please go ahead and feel free to pay also. <laughs> If you are capable of paying, please go ahead and pay. Uh, if you if you say no, I can't pay. It's okay. Just just enroll yourself. Let's worry about the finances later. Okay. Um, this is important. That's why I'm saying, church, please make sure you're there on that day and make use of that day. Uh, well, and we will have a lot of time to interact and ask questions. And I may not have all the answers, but I'll prepare myself. Ask the Holy Spirit to help me to remember, and and I might try and invite some more people leaders to join us, and maybe they'll be um, able to give you a little more insight than me. So it'll be easier uh, for us. It's, it's going to be a long day, uh, but it's going to be a worth day, a day, of, you know, day that you invested well into your life. All right? Uh, and then, of course, the weekend after that, we have um, Global Leadership Summit coming up um, on the 3rd of uh, December. If you have not enrolled, just go ahead and enroll yourself into Global Leadership Network, uh, you know, Summit on that on the 3rd of December. Uh, do we have this? OK, do we have the video? You're going to show the video? OK, forget about it. Just show the. Oh. No volume. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Uh, so, uh, by the way, just for your information, Global Leadership Summit happens as a video conference. Okay, remember that. That means they they'll have the you know uh, the speaker speaking directly to us through via video. Um, we we don't have John Akoff um, this time. We have somebody else, Deblu, who is going to speak to us in in his place. But rest of the speakers are stand as it is. Uh, they, you know they're going to bring um, some very important uh, leadership principles for us. So if you if you are in some kind of position, um, meaning any position, wherever you're working, you're a leader. Remember that. Uh, every one of you is a leader. You will, you are an influencer. So um, do make sure you join us uh, on the 3rd of December. Meet Pastor Janet. She'll um, give you on how to register for that. Um, we, of course, next two weeks we have uh, missions weekends on the 20th and 27th uh, of November, uh, two different locations. Nizam and Jaipur, Pastor Ashwant is here. In case you want to join, make sure you meet them and uh, make sure you meet him. He'll be able to guide you on how to enroll yourself. Uh, for that. Uh, we're going to take our offerings and our tithes at this time. Before we do that, let me just, um, um, can I have the um, Christmas box, please? Okay, last week, we had, we, we just gave away 150 boxes last week. Okay, and so, and I realized a lot of more, a lot more people wanted, so we got a smaller one, because uh, the one that we made uh, would take almost 15 days to arrive. And it is super expensive, and I thought, no, nah, I don't want to spend no, spend money right now. So we, we already have smaller shoe boxes, which you can simply use uh, to fill. Okay, so you can take some of these boxes. Uh, you still want to take, and I, I know many of you still um, could not because last week they they were not available. So you just have to fold them, tape them, and bring them to us. Is that okay? Everything else, it still looks cool, isn't it? Well, like this, it looks cool. So, and so these are stickers, so we, we just stack them on the shoebox. They're free for you. Just go ahead and pick them as many as you. I think we got another 150, right? We got another 150. I'm, I'm assuming that we'll finish it by today. Um, at the end of the service, please go ahead and take them. And um, first week of December is when you're going to bring them back. Some of it, you can actually give it away to people you know already to whom you, you want to give, please go ahead and do that. But if you have extra and you, you want, you're taking extra, please bring them on the third, first week of December, which we will then use it to send out to the kids that we are supporting. And if we have more, we'll send more. We, we are supporting an orphanage in Jabalpur from our church. Um, there are, I think there are about 25 students there that um, the, those students will send. Um, we already have, how many kids we are, are we um, sponsoring this year? 30, 30 children uh, whom our church is actually taking care of, pastor's kids whom our church is supporting. That's about 55 now, and we might have more. So in case if you take more, please bring them here, and we will send them to them as a Christmas gift. Is that okay? All right. Okay, let me take uh, this time to pray for you as you prepare to give to the Lord. Father, I want to thank you um, for the joy of uh, serving you through our giving. Would you please accept our offering and use it for your kingdom? Thank you for... Um, the joy of, um, of um, you know, sowing into your kingdom and experiencing your providence in our own personal life. We bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you as you give to the Lord.
Let's do the Lord's Prayer together as we stand uh, to our feet. Um, it is another, it's, it's still a joy to come into the presence of God. I want to um, show you something else as we pray. And um, what do you see? Every week it is our practice to do the Lord's Prayer. Not that we didn't know, but it's, it's a good thing that we pray together. That's why we do the Lord's Prayer together. And before I, we do that, of course, I want to pray a prayer of blessing. At the end of a Lord's Prayer, we always receive um, a blessing, right? Um, actually, it is based on um, First Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 13, verses 14, where uh, Paul uh, pronounces a blessing on people as he closes their letter. And then um, I, I suddenly realized, actually, uh, he talks about how the, the Trinitarian God the three persons in Godhead, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, each one give a special gift to us. May the love of the Father and the grace of His Son, Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, each one is a different gift. Father's love gift, John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Father's love gift was His Son. The love. Um, Son's gift to us is his grace. That um, we receive more than what we deserve. Um, and then the Holy Spirit's gift is his friendship to us. Communion of the Holy Spirit. Being with us always. So, uh, you know, the Trinitarian God is, that's, that's how important three is. 
uh, in our lives. Yeah. Just wanted to highlight that for you before you pray. Next time, every time you receive the blessing, you know this now. Oh, this is not just some guy standing there and saying some word. It's actually a gift that God is giving me. Remember that always. Father, I want to thank you for the joy of coming together, worshiping together, and uh, receiving the word together. And may you, God, uh, work through our lives, in our lives, uh, first in our lives and through our lives. And we now understand that um, while the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives uh, is important uh, as it changes us, transforms us, we also need to understand the significance of a working of the Holy Spirit through our lives. And thank you for opening scriptures to us. Help us to understand. Give us, um, in case we, some of us are struggling with understanding this, would you please enlighten us? Holy Spirit, um, you not only guide us to the truth, you teach us the truth. And so uh, we pray that you teach us and help us to um, be open uh, for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, thank you, God, for everyone who chose to lis listen and receive. And I pray for those who received it by faith. Each one, I pray that God, that they would experience your anointing upon their lives. That each one would be able to be empowered, would be empowered and would be able to serve your kingdom at large. I pray that their spiritual would be gifted, gifts would be manifested. I pray that um, some of them uh, would begin to, by faith, begin to use their spiritual gifts. Um, gifts of healing, gifts of prophecy, gifts of uh, teaching, uh, gifts of evangelism. I pray gifts of leadership, gifts of administration. I pray each of those gifts would begin to um, express through them, manifest through them as they receive your word. Thank you, God, um, for, um, uh, for your word today and speaking to us. As we go back home, I pray that your voice would continue to speak to us. Your presence would continue to be with us and uh, helping us, not only soaking us in your presence, but helping us to um, walk in, a, um, in an intimate walk with you, uh, in relationship with you. Thank you um, for the communion of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the whole. Amen. May the love of the Father, and the grace of, the, uh, of our Son, Jesus Christ, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us, now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Uh, we'll see you next week.